Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Ondra Kozina. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, working on Crypt Setup uh, in Upstream. I'm also a co-maintainer of uh, Crypt Setup package in uh, Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux distribution and in Fedora. And I'm part of uh, virtu virtualization, uh, virtual storage team in, a, uh, in a Red Hat. And uh, I would like to talk about how we uh, have integrated uh, Set uh, set up devices with Wax uh, like two format. <clears throat> uh, first, uh, what is self encrypting drive? Uh, basically, in the scope of this talk, uh, it's a block device that needs to be uh, compliant with a uh, uh, trusted computing group uh, Opel version two uh, <clears throat> uh, standard, uh, which is uh, a big, quite a long document describing a lot of features that. Uh, set device, uh, uh, set Opal device needs to uh, basically implement. Uh, it's a quite complex document. Also, there are many features we are not interested for the purpose, we are not interested in for the purpose of this talk. Uh, and we, uh, on purpose, we basically cherry picked only very limited set of uh, features from that uh, standard uh, for a Crypt Setup use case. Um, <clears throat> It needs to implement. Uh, uh, it needs to implement uh, IS cipher in hardware. Both uh, key length variants are, are basically supported. Uh, the disk encryption key—that's how they uh, call basically a volume key or media encryption key in the in that OPA2 terminology—is uh, sealed in a device. It's uh, generated by a random uh, number generator, also sealed in that device. So uh, the uh, Key life cycle is completely managed by that uh, by the device in hardware, and also disk encryption key should be pro should be protected by an authentication key or a so-called PIN in the uh, in the terminology, which is uh, basically a secret uh, user needs to provide when uh, when uh, he would like to unlock uh, such device. <clears throat> okay. Now, a short history of a Crypt Setup community pushback against this feature. Uh, why we were basically for a long time against uh, any integration with uh, a hardware-based encryption uh, in open devices. First of all, Crypt Setup is and always was associated with uh, software-based full description. By definition, it's an open source project, so the source codes are uh, Open, they are available for for audit, for a security audit. If someone would be interested, bugs are very easy easy to find and fix, and so on. On the other hand, the hardware-based encryption in a in a firmware or in a set of devices is a completely different story. Uh, there were there is a nice uh, paper published in I believe 2018. It's called Self Encrypting Deception. Uh, that described many 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 issues with those uh, with those devices. Uh, just a few examples. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a random number uh, generator in the device that's used to basically generate the, the disk encryption key. Some of those random number generators were basically not uh, suitable for a, for a cryptography for a cryptography grade. Uh, sometimes, the, uh, in some some examples, I believe the, uh, the disk encryption key was basically constant. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, um, they found that basically, even though that there's this uh, authentication pin or a, a key that needs to that should be used to basically uh, uh, unlock the disk encryption key, so, so sometimes the, that key was used only as an authentication, but the key, the uh, disk encryption key itself, was stored in a playtext in the device, so also not nice, uh, and so on. And, that's a general problem that basically, even though that the standardization document describing the Sadopal device is uh, quite uh, verbose about what features those devices need to provide, it doesn't publish basically any information on a crypto scheme design and how it should be done in that uh, Opal, uh, Opal device. So, just an example. We believe that, uh, believe, nice word, uh, we believe that the authentication Pin uh, should basically enter some uh, key derivation function to derive a key encryption key that's used to encrypt the disk encryption key. But it's not specified what key derivation function needs to be used. So, uh, for example, some devices probably use PBKDF2. Some devices uh, are using some uh, um, <coughs> proprietary 
cloud source uh, algorithm, which is basically impossible to, to audit, and, uh, and so on. And most notably, this was basically a, a technical blocker. Those previews are basically a, a sort of a approach or a, uh, approach problems. Um, there was complete lack of higher level API for managing uh, set devices. So this means that we would have to either use some uh, um, <clears throat> referential implementation uh, in user space, but uh, all the packages that were used to uh, manage set of devices were unmaintained, buggy, basically problematic. So we didn't want to link to those uh, libraries or adopt that uh, code. So what we would have to do before uh, is that we would basically have to implement a very low level, uh, very low level uh, protocol that's used to communicate with Sudoku devices. Uh, it's either NVMe security commands uh, passed over IOC or uh, SCSI security protocol commands. And you would have to basically uh, construct a, a bind stream, byte stream representation of uh, configuration tables that are used for set open devices. So you would have to establish a session, uh, basically construct that bind stream and so on. So we would have to implement a lot of code that we basically didn't want to have to maintain uh, in a libcrypt setup. And there were are, there are more issues. Uh, for example, it's a very difficult to identify a set device uh, in, a, in a locked state. I mean, from a, from a perspective of, for example, a system, uh, system or, or bootloader. Uh, usually you have a, you, you like to read the information about block device, for example, from a block layer exposed via SysFS or whatever. But for a set open device, if you want to know about the state of that locked region, which is called lock, uh, locking range, you would have to pass the special IOCTL call, which requires authentication. Not nice. Uh, also, the uh, locked, uh, locked region basically returns uh, IO errors uh, if you try to read, read those regions or, or, or write those regions, which in a worst case might, for example, trigger a controller reset on the, device, uh, on the system because the device returns IO errors, right? And uh, in the past, there were basically no reasonable performance advantage over software based full description for this encryption. So that pretty much sums the reason why we didn't want to do it. So why are we here? And OK, so a short history of Crypt Setup community turnaround. Uh, first notable change is that basically in 2017, uh, there was a Seroquel higher level interface introduced in a kernel, which, is, which basically uh, allowed us to get rid of the need to re-implement everything in you know, a low level or to use that uh, buggy implementation that was uh, available in the past. It's a high-level interface. It's still IOCTL interface, but uh, you pass the parameters as basically standard C structures. And if you want to uh, set up, for example, locking range, you will specify offset range. Uh, you will pass uh, uh, user, authentic, user identity ID in a, uh, you know, integers and so on. So it's much easier to use, I would say. Uh, in late 2021, we've got the first suggestion uh, to use uh, that higher level Sadopo interface and uh, basically to adopt Opal encryption with that. This we rejected yet, but basically the first seed of uh, hesitation was basically implanted. Uh, so in you know, late 2022, uh, the community was uh, very persistent in this case. <laughs> Uh, they uh, introduced a full pull, uh, first pull request with a prototype, which we basically used to start the testing. Uh, and we've tested many devices in upstream. Uh, we were trying how, how the devices behave and so on. Uh, and as a result, we basically started to do some improvements to kernel interface. Because, for example, we needed to be able to read the locking range parameters after they are uh, created on those uh, topo devices. And there were two reasons for that. First, uh, there were some issues, again, <laughs> with uh, those devices. And uh, secondly, that Opal 2 standard, for some reason, I really don't know the background for that, 
decided that the locking energies sh should be aligned uh, based on different limits than block layer limits. Uh, block layer limits are basically logical block size. That's uh, how you need to align your partitions. That's uh, how file system needs to align their I.O. on the device and so on. But set Opal, uh, Opal standard decided to have different interface to read these alignment uh, limits. And those limits are different from block layers. This will be interesting. Uh, uh, this will be important later. And also, uh, we have measured some performance. Uh, and we had to basically acknowledge that, yes, first uh, use case where this might uh, make sense is basically uh, low power CPUs uh, in embedded systems, uh, which lacks basically hardware accelerated IS implementation. And basically, those devices would benefit from, from uh, encryption offloaded to the hardware. The second uh, example, which was more interesting, because it was um, uh, basically a, a server-grade uh, machine, uh, when you put, uh, I think it was like eight uh, high-performing NVMe devices into the systems, I believe it was PCI Express Generation 4, I, I, I believe, and you put DMCrypt on top of each of those devices, and then you try to hammer it by I/O quite heavily in parallel. You you might see uh, you might uh, basically see a CPU like server grade CPU to be able to like because those devices are so fast that they can generate so much uh, uh, load on the CPU that it might be uh, measurable and it might uh, generate basically a performance drop. Uh, in, comparison, in comparison to uh, the hardware-based encryption. And also, with the use of uh, this high-level interface in a kernel, and also by, in the time, eventually integrating this feature into LAX2 format, we could easily, uh, easily introduce uh, two-layer uh, two encryption. Basically, software-based encryption on top of hardware-based one. And Crip setup would basically serve as a single uh, point of control to manage those, uh, those devices and, and the encryption. So uh, we are moving uh, to a final implementation in uh, for the LAX2 Opal extension. Again, as I have said, we used a very limited subset of Opal features. We were basically only interested in setting up locking ranges so that we might uh, so that we might uh, uh, basically pinpoint uh, some area on the device that needs to be uh, encrypted by the hardware. We create user authorities, which, has, which are entities that uh, we assign to uh, lo created locking range that might uh, have um, rights to uh, locate, unlocate, and so on, basically to, to read the data stored there. Uh, that user authority uh, uh, has a pin or that authentication key which we store in a LAX2 key slots and protect it uh, the same way as we basically protect volume key in a software-based encryption, even though that's, it's not a really uh, the disk encryption key. It's just a, a secret used to unlock that uh, disk encryption key in the Opal device. And uh, Opal locking range is basically, basically represents a new data segment in LAX2 format. Data segment, that's, uh, that's a metadata that describes how we how we handle the uh, data area beyond the data offset specified in LAX2, uh, LAX2 metadata. So we, pro we, we have added two new uh, segments. First is used in a hardware only uh, Opal encryption, and second is used in a, in a software based, based <coughs> encryption stacked on top of the hardware Opal. You may use, uh, as a device backend, you may use partition or a whole block device, we support both. Uh, you may use up to eight partitions per device due to the limit that uh, there are up to eight locking ranges that are configurable freely. Uh, it's available since Crypt Setup 2.7, uh, which was released this year, but I would strongly recommend to use the latest version because we were fixing bugs in uh, some bugs in our code base. And we have added uh, some workarounds on a faulty, on a faulty or buggy uh, firmware in those uh, uh, Opal 2 devices. We aimed for basically full 
compatibility with Lux2 devices, because another nice advantage of basically adopting the hardware, uh, hardware Opal encryption uh, into the Lux2 format is that after you create such device, uh, it's, uh, it's basically a Lux2 device. Every, every software built on top of uh, Lux2 or libcrypt setup should work basically out of the box. We do not change the way how you unlock the device. It's still the same crypt setup open command or libcrypt setup uh, API for, act for device activation. Uh, so as you can see, there are only two option, new options in a Lux, uh, Lux format command. One for uh, hardware-only hardware encryption, the second for, uh, for uh, stacked encryption. And crypt, crypt setup erase is basically used to tear down setup blocking range uh, so that you can uh, use that device region freely. And also we have added uh, basically a full hardware uh, Opal factory reset, which uh, requires PSID and this basically reverts the device back to a factory setting and completely disables the uh, Opal encryption subsystem in that, in that block device. There are some, only two exceptions we do not support currently. Uh, one is resize, and that's due to the fact that um, a locking range cannot be, uh, the, the locking range, when it's uh, defined on top of uh, Opal device, cannot be resized without data distraction. So if you want to resize the lock, uh, locking range, you need to tear that down and create a new one, which basically erases the data. So you can't resize it. Theoretically, we could, we could add the support to sharing the device, because uh, uh, you you may map a smaller size of the existing locking range, but we said, okay, unless there is a strong demand for it, uh, there's no reason to do it. Also, re-encryption, uh, re-encrypt command doesn't work currently because there's no way how to uh, change the uh, encryption parameters of that uh, locking range without erasing that. Theoretically, we could add uh, uh, re-encrypt command for a, for a software on top of hardware-based uh, uh, locking range, but maybe later. Uh, and this is how it looks, just, just a short schema which describes how it looks after you basically activate the device. As I said, you may use a, a partition or a whole block device. Uh, in the beginning of the, of the device, there's a, a plain text area with Lux2 metadata, uh, as, as with uh, ordinary Lux2 device. Then we define a locking range, that's the area protected by hardware. And on top of it, we activate either, either DM linear mapping uh, in a hardware only mode or DM crypt mapping in our case of uh, stacked encryption on top of hardware one. Okay, so it's nice. Uh, during the implementation of, uh, of that and during the testing, we have, uh, we have found some, some new bugs. Uh, uh, as I told about, we need to add some, some new API to that uh, Sedopal kernel interface. It's due to the fact that, again, those uh, Opal 2 devices sometimes do really strange things. So some faulty device, for example, after you have uh, defined the locking range with a correct uh, offset and length and issued a lock command to that uh, locking range, uh, that command basically returns success, but if you look at the if locking range and read the properties of that locking range, it remains unlocked. Hmm? Uh, sometimes, there were, uh, in a, at least in one device, we have uh, encountered a bug in processing of 64-bit integers. Uh, I don't recall the details exactly, but basically, uh, you were unable to use uh, any numbers that were uh, larger than 16 bits, I think. So uh, in, a, in a time of terabyte size devices, it's really bad. <laughs> and uh, one example that, that was, uh, again, really ugly, uh, when you try to create a locking range on a top of a Sedopo device, you, you need to set an offset and length. And again, you issue create command. It, uh, it returns uh, success you read back the property of the locking ranges, and the offset and length are different for some reason. I don't know. Probably some, some bug in, in, the, in the middle layer on the in, on in translation layer uh, in, that, uh, in that device. Uh, who knows? Uh, and the last one, uh, uh, first in the slides, this is, uh, 
This one is uh, really ugly and it's uh, addressed in a future 2.7.3 release, this, uh, which should come next week. Uh, if, uh, if you recall, I, I was uh, mentioning that uh, Opel standard for some, for some reason doesn't use block layer limits. It uses their own limits exposed by, uh, uh, some, uh, by IOT discovery command. And also, uh, there are uh, newer NVMe devices support uh, something called uh, configurable logical block addressing format profiles. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, those are NVMe devices that might uh, that are able to change their uh, logical block size. So, uh, usually from factory, you will receive NVMe device formatted with uh, logical block size uh, half kilobyte logical block size. But uh, for performance reasons, you might issue NVMe format command and change the logical block addressing format, for example, to 4K. Okay, that's nice. Block layer uh, reflects this, this change just okay. Uh, when you read the block layer limits, it's uh, increased to 4K. But on some devices, after we read the OPAL uh, alignment limits from that uh, IOCTL, it returns still the old value. So in a, in a case of 4K formatted NVMe device, it's still returned uh, half kilobyte. But in fact, <laughs> It was using the uh, new value exposed by block layer, which, uh, which resulted in a, in a locking range that was basically uh, with a eight times higher offset and eight times higher length. Not nice. Uh, in practice, what does it mean? Um, on a, if, if you were using a whole block device as a, as a backend, it would basically uh, end with error that there's uh, not enough space on, the, on that device, uh, which is okay because you were basically unable to create such locking range. But in case uh, you were trying to uh, map a locking range exactly one-to-one -one with a partition, uh, you will end up with a partition where uh, initial sectors are basically not protected by locking range because that uh, offset is basically eight times higher. And uh, also the length is eight, eight times higher, which means that the locking range actually spills outside the partition. Uh, which also means that all the data beyond that partition you would like to create are basically destroyed at the moment. Uh, again, not nice. Uh, we have basically encountered two uh, NVMe devices that have, that uh, has this time uh, this type of uh, behavior. We have uh, reported uh, those uh, those findings, and we are basically waiting for uh, for a reply. Mm, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that at least one of those devices is uh, currently manufactured and uh, being sold. The second one is probably manufactured as well, but uh, it's a it's it's a server grade uh, PCI Express device. So. Yeah, not so sure. Uh, so yeah, uh, there are some reasons to be cautious, uh, to be cautious about uh, uh, hardware file encryption uh, even now. Uh, some uh, short future roadmap: what we might implement in the future for uh, for uh, 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 a support. We are considering to uh, support uh, support for a so-called single-user mode Opal devices. Uh, what does it mean? Currently. Uh, there's an admin authority that is uh, required to create uh, new locking ranges and assign user authorities to those, uh, uh, to those locking ranges. And user authority, locking, uh, user authority should be used to basically lock and unlock the device so that you don't have to use the admin authority all the time. Unfortunately, that admin authority have full access over all locking ranges on the device. So, if, you, if the uh, admin authority gets leaked for some reason, uh, it have, uh, it have access to all the locking ranges, and there's no way currently how to disallow uh, the admin authority to, uh, to control the uh, user locking ranges. And this is exactly what the single user mode is trying to address. Uh, single user mode uh, is... Um, is changed uh, in, a, in a way that admin authority can create the locking range, it can destroy the locking range as well, but it can never unlock the locking range. So they cannot see uh, the content of the locking range. 
And there's a, a new standard also. Uh, it's called uh, Keeper IO. This is standard. It's a quite recent standard. I think it was published last uh, September. Again, it's a complex document. It uh, describes a lot of new things that they would like to have in those hardware encryption devices. But for us, or from our perspective, there's one interesting uh, bit in, in, in that paper, and this is that those devices should, should basically allow to media encryption keys being injected into the said device and not managed by the device. So you may generate the uh, uh, media encryption key outside the device, you may store it outside the device, and then you inject it into the device after you, uh, you would like to uh, unlock, unlock the device. Uh, the, the standard explicitly specifies that the media encryption key must never ever uh, land uh, on a non-volatile memory. So it's only in some cache and after you lost power, uh, the key should disappear. That's it. I would like to thank to uh, two persons. First, Luca Bocassi, who, who was the person from a community uh, that uh, worked on a, basically co-development on a like to Opel support. Uh, he made the original prototype and he basically uh, kept persuading us to implement it. And I would also like to thank to Samuel Petrovich who helped me uh, a lot with the performance testing uh, on those uh, servers. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, okay, go ahead. So you mentioned that there wasn't uh, an observable or like a big performance impact. How did you exactly measure the performance? How did you exactly? Uh, okay, I don't have it in the slides. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, we can we can uh, publish this on a, on a on a GitLab repository on our Steam Tracker. Basically, it was a file script that was bombarding each of those devices uh, by uh, I.O. in parallel. Uh, so it's, it was a sort of artificial test or a synthetic test because we were trying to push the CPU of that system to the limits, like on purpose. Uh, it's not a real work load we would be aware of, but we wanted to prove that there might be, the, might be a use case where this makes sense because even the server-grade CPU will basically become a bottleneck. Okay. Yeah, so let's say I'm a less skilled user, and since there are some issues with, the, with the, some implementations in the hardware, let's say, uh, is there any like Google script or whatever which would tell me, yeah, your system is going to be using? So uh, I, will, I need to repeat the question, uh, so uh, correct me if I understand it correctly. You would like to know if there is a, a tool that will be able to tell you this device is safe to use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, it's called Cryptotop. <laughs> no, I mean, issue, uh, some of those issues uh, basically means that you don't know unless you try. That's the problem. So uh, some issues uh, might be detected quite, uh, quite early. For example, that this uh, 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 the problem with the logical block size reported by a block layer and the logical block size reported by the Opal standard that can be detected in advance. But those, for example, broken locking ranges uh, after you create it, you first have to try to create it. Unfortunately. If it's try and tell me. That yeah, it, it will. The problem is it will try to do it and tell you. The problem, uh, problem is that the, the locking range creation is destructive operation. That's, that's the issue. Even, even with the destructive nature, in, like, I don't use the videos, you know. Not destructive with regard to data. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, OK. Maybe uh, related to that question. Uh, you obviously tested a couple of implementations, a couple of hardware pieces. Yeah, various vendors, various devices. Uh, mo yeah, most of the bugs I was mentioning are mentioned in that self-encrypting deception paper. And those new findings we, we reported uh, 
we decided to first report it and see if they respond. If they do not respond, we will disclose, disclose that information as well. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the question was if if you can convert all, already existing data existing data yes, to this. Uh, no, no. The, uh, again, the issue is the same. The the creation of locking ranges is, is destructive operation. So all data on the on the uh, on the blocks that uh, you want to protect by a new locking range are basically wiped. It's a very good question, but answer will be quite long. I don't know how much time do we have. Uh, yeah. So the question is, if we have a support for S3, uh, S3 suspend. Uh, OK. Uh, two, uh, two things. We upload the, uh, when, when, we, when we activate the locking range, uh, we issue the, that bit that basically caches the, the, caches the key and kernel key ring. So, if you suspend, uh, if you suspend your laptop with an active, uh, active Crip setup device, uh, and and you resume the uh, uh, the laptop, it will work. Uh, the device will reactivate itself on, 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 on their own. If you issue lux suspend command, lux suspend command, which is basically uh, supposed to, to to suspend the encryption, we will erase the key from the kernel keying. We will overwrite it. So. Unless you uh, try crypt setup uh, lux uh, resume again, the device will not come back. So, so we basically we are basically destroying the key in a kernel keying uh, on purpose during lux suspend. But if you do not do lux suspend, it will it will come back uh, come back online just fine. Okay, uh, do we have a touch? Yeah. So I That user authority pin? Uh, no, no, it would not be user operated. Uh, I, I probably do not follow, follow so the question. Imagine that the, the device boots and it's able to, uh, to get uh, maybe the, the, the key from the VPN on the device mm -hmm. and be secure in how that is communicated. I tried to repeat that question, but maybe Sorry, the, the problem will, uh, it was possible if I understand or not. Uh, you are asking if there is a way to uh, basically protect the passphrase. Uh, uh, okay, I, I will. That was not in the original question. Are you aware that there are some plugins in a Lux 2 that basically. I'm uh, sorry, are out of time. We can discuss that okay, offline. Yeah. 